So what is going on with these road trips we're talking about? Well, it turns out, turns out the stories in the Bible that involve traveling have an awful lot that they can teach us, profound things about God and also about our own journeys, our own traveling stories throughout our lives. Um, we've been in this series a little bit uh, during this summer, but here's the good news. If you're joining us for one of the first times here on site, if you are joining us online and this is one of your first times joining us this summer, there is good news for you. You are not too late. Uh, all of these road trip stories stand alone. Uh, and that is the truth with the one that I'm going to talk to you about today. So you don't have to have seen all the other sermons. You're going to be able to pick it up from what I'm talking to you about today. And I got to admit, something. I got a little bit of a bone to pick with whoever planned these series and who was going to do them and when, because I think I have the shortest, most, I guess, uninteresting story of the whole bunch, okay? So I'm going to do my best to make it interesting for you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John. I work with the Welcome Ministries. I'm a little upset about it. I'm, let me read for you the entire journey, okay? We're going to get to this later uh, in the story, but I, to, right now I'm going to read you just the entire thing. Are you ready? It comes from Acts chapter 10. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived. That's it. That's the story. Do something life-changing with that, right? Well, we're going to do our best. We're going to see what we can do with this short little uh, journey that we hear about in the scriptures. The reality is there's a huge journey going on in this story. But as I was looking at it, as I was thinking about how this is just kind of the last half of one verse and the, and the first half of the next verse, I thought about trips. And I thought about how sometimes... It's not the duration, but it's the transformation that takes place. It's, it's not how long the trip takes. It's not how long we stay there, uh, but the impact that it has. And we all know this to be true, right? We all have these experiences in our lives. Maybe it's college. College, just four years, and yet it is life altering, right? People make friendships that they have for the rest of their lives. My wife has a, a group, uh, the girls, and the girls get together. Or they try to get together uh, at least maybe once a year or every few years. They keep trying to see each other, even though it's been decades since they met. And they only really had that concentrated short time. It has impacted their lives. This week, it's going to happen. I'm getting ready to go with some, uh, some students to camp. Camp is one of those things where the duration is short, but the impact is forever. Here's what happens at camp. For those of you who don't know, uh, at church camp, everybody arrives as strangers, and then five days later, they're like, oh, I can't believe we're leaving. I can't believe I got to give up my best friend because everybody grows so close in the midst of that. My, my daughter, Audrey, did camp for the first time last year, and uh, they always come up with these like, kind of cheesy names for their groups. It's like the God Squad or like the Gospel Guys or something. Uh, her team did something really literal. They had to wear these green bands, so they called themselves the Green Team, uh, and when they got back from camp, though they started this group chat called the green team group chat and it lasted for months after camp uh, we've all experienced this at different points in our lives that it's not a, so much about the length of time but the impact that it makes in our lives it's not necessarily about the duration but it is about the transformation that can take place and that is the case with the story that we are going to talk about today uh, like I mentioned before, it comes from the book of Acts. If you want to follow along, go ahead and open up your Bible to the book of Acts or scroll on your Bible app uh, to Acts. I, I want to set this book up just a little bit for you. Uh, we know that the Bible is a collection of different books. And the last few are about Jesus or about the impact of Jesus. We call that the New Testament. The first four in the New Testament are these stories from people who witnessed things Jesus did. And it's these, these testimonies about his life, about his death, about his resurrections. We call those four the Gospels. And then right after that, we have this book called the Acts of the Apostles. It's about the apostles, the ones who were sent out by Jesus, and the actions that they did after Jesus' resurrection. So it's called the Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to hear 
one of those stories today. It's going to be in chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 is where I am starting out. Join me. Acts chapter 10, starting just with verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need. He prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. And then the angel said, I know it's confusing. There's both named Simon, but look for the one who's paler. Okay, my note said pause for laughter right there. And I think I, I, I feel like I really brought it with that joke and y'all didn't really bring it with the laughter, okay? So next time there's a joke, I need you to bring it, all right? I'm just kidding. I know it was cheesy. Tanner guy, he worked with leather. Uh, he's staying in the house by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Let me talk to you a little bit about this guy, this scene. It's got Cornelius who is staying in Caesarea. But really what Cornelius is, is Cornelius is a representative of Rome. Now, when we hear the word Rome, we all picture things in our heads because this was a world-changing civilization. Let's do a little word association. And I'm going to count to three, and then I'm going to say the word Rome, and then I want to tell you what pops in your mind when you think of Rome. Are you ready? Ready for this? Okay. One, two, three, Rome. Statues, Colosseum, I heard somebody. Somebody said aqueducts. All three services, somebody says aqueducts. This cracks me up about Rome. I mean, I mean there are so many just these, these amazing things like the architecture and the art and the political system, the military. But we're always like, but hey, those aqueducts. Those aqueducts were amazing. Even my daughter, I was telling her about my sermon. I told her I was going to be talking about Rome. And she went, oh, the aqueducts. She's 13. And that's what she knows about Rome. Uh, but really, Rome was a fascinating, fascinating civilization. And Cornelius is in this outpost of Rome called Caesarea. Thus, you know, the name, it's named after Caesar. But here's the truth about Rome. Yes, it had tremendous impact. Yes, it is fascinating. It was also morally bankrupt. Their abundance allowed them a lot of indulgence. It was spiritually confused. You see, one of the ways they kept peace is they would let people worship different gods and kind of do their old thing. But there were a couple of exceptions. You could worship pretty much any god you wanted, except that god can have no interest in political power. If that happens, you're dead. And when our Caesar comes around, and even at the little shrines we've built for Caesar in the different cities, you must worship the Caesar as if he is a god. You must say, Caesar is Lord. Spiritually confused. Also, Rome was terrifyingly brutal. If you stepped out of line, you were likely to die, and it was almost always a cruel death. They just got good at killing people. And yet in the midst of this culture, there's this guy named Cornelius. Cornelius looking around at the abundance and the indulgence, and he's saying, yeah, I guess it can make you happy for a minute, but it's not really bringing me peace. Uh, Cornelius looking around at these Caesars who demanded to be worshipped, and he said, listen, these guys aren't even good. I don't know why we think they're gods. And then he saw this group of people, the Jews, he found out they believed in one God. He found out they believed that everybody had sinned against that God and needed mercy. But he found out that that God gives mercy. And because those people believed that, they were a merciful people. They did lots of good stuff for those in need. And something about this sparks something in Cornelius. And Cornelius wants to know more. 
That's the first scene of this story, the the setup of this story. Uh, The story in the book of Acts quickly switches scenes, and so we're going to jump into it and see the other scene that we need to recognize. Acts chapter 10 is starting at verse 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey, those they being the ones that Cornelius sent to find Peter, uh, and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. It happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back into heaven. I need to talk to you about Peter, okay? If Cornelius represented Rome, Peter represented something else, and this might get lost on us, no matter if we're new to church or we've been around a long time. Peter grew up in a Jewish community. Peter was a Jewish man, And even after he started believing in Jesus, he started following Jesus, he saw Jesus rise from the dead, Peter was still a Jewish man who believed in Jesus. We have to recognize in this story that that is something that Peter represents, the perspective of those Christians who grew up Jewish. And we need to talk about what we believe about the Jewish people. We believe that God chose the Jewish people centuries before Jesus. God chose the Jewish people because God wanted to teach them all about his mercy and his wisdom and his teaching. He wanted them to have a special relationship, a special understanding of God. Now, the point was always that one day they would take their understanding of God's mercy and God's God's, uh, teaching and they would send that out into the world. They would let the rest of the world know it. They would be lights unto the nations. But during that time, while God was molding and shaping them, God was very protective of the Jewish people. God wanted to be the major influence in their world and in their community. And so one of the things that God did is he asked certain things of them that would help shape them as a community, things that would limit them being overly influenced by other cultures. And that's a main reason behind some of the food laws that we find in the Old Testament. Now, you know, even if you're not super, super familiar with the history of religions, a lot of people know uh, about food and the Jewish people. Uh, For example, the ancient Jews and even some Orthodox Jews and some other Jewish people today, they tend not to eat pork. Right. We would have been terrible Jews last week, right? Because last week was Father's Day. We had some dad snacks. We did bacon. We did sausage. We did bacon wrapped in biscuits. And we did uh, hot dogs wrapped in bacon. We did four versions of pork, right? (laughs) So obviously... Those laws don't apply to us anymore, but they were very serious for them. There was something that God knew, something that they as Jewish people knew, and something that we know. Food plays a vital role in our relationships, does it not? I bet there are some of you sitting in here today, some of you joining us online, and I bet you get together with some of your friends to eat often. You probably have like an establishment. You go down to Cracker Barrel or you go down to Gourmet or you meet at the country club or maybe it's McDonald's or Starbucks, but you had your food that you share together. My son, Jack, he meets some of his friends down at Buffalo Wild Wings. They say, we're going to go meet a B-dubs, right? Now, here's the thing. What if I said to my son, hey, I don't want you going down to B-dubs anymore? What he's not going to hear is, I got a problem with those wings. (laughs) What he would hear is, I don't want you to be overly influenced by those people. That is what was going on with the food laws. That's what's going on with Peter's vision about these different types of animals and the voice saying, kill and eat. 
God was limiting the menu so that he could limit the time the Jewish people were spending with people from other cultures and other communities. People from other cultures thought the Jews were kind of, kind of prideful because they wouldn't eat that cheap meat pork and they wouldn't get together with them for meals. They were prideful and exclusive to other uh, communities, but the reality was it, they weren't prideful and exclusive. They were being shaped by God. They had a special relationship with God and God was seeking to protect that relationship. That's what we have going on. But when Jesus died, something vital happened. The relationship that the Jews shared, the special exclusive relationship, access to God's wisdom and his mercy was now available for everyone. It was to be sent out. And that was hard for many of the people who grew up Jewish and became Christians. They liked the place of superiority for some. And for many, that was difficult to give up. That's the picture that we have. When you look at these pictures on the stage, what you really see is the journey that was happening in this story. I know it was just a one verse. I know it was uh, just uh, you know, a couple of small towns. Uh, Paul, I mean, Peter was staying in the Jewish outpost or the Jewish settlement of Joppa. Cornelius was in the Roman outpost of Caesarea, but they really represented these places that were 1,400 miles apart, Rome and Jerusalem. It's the story of the book of Acts, actually. The book that you have open right now. Chapter 1 starts in Jerusalem. Chapter 28, spoiler alert, ends in Rome. But here's what we have to catch today. While Rome and Jerusalem were 1,434 miles apart, while even Joppa and Caesarea were 30 miles apart, the real trip that happens in this story is only 12 inches. From the head to the heart. It's a journey both Cornelius and Peter had to make as this grand story unfolded. And it's the one that I want you to see today. Let me talk just a little bit about Cornelius and his transformation. Uh, Cornelius in Caesarea, he was super successful. He was a centurion in the Italian regiment, which meant he had probably at least 100 men under his command. He was comfortable. Man, the post Caesarea was a beautiful place on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. He had people serving him anytime that he wanted. He was successful. He was comfortable. He was even good. I mean, we read about it in the story. He prayed and he gave to the poor. Anybody in that situation of Cornelius could be feeling pretty good about themselves. I'm successful, I'm comfortable, and I do some good things. But Cornelius knew something was missing. And what he did was offer an invitation. He offered an invitation to someone who knew a little bit more about Jesus than he did. He had to humble himself and say, I need to be around this person. I need to be around these people. Cornelius made an invitation. Cornelius knew something about life that we know about life. And that is this. You become who you surround yourself with. I got teenagers that I'm trying to teach this, right? All the time. You become who you surround yourselves with. But it is not just for teenagers. It's for all of us as we grow and we go through life. The people we surround ourselves with are so important. And Cornelius knew this and he made an invitation. And I wonder if there might be some of us in this room who can relate to Cornelius. You don't necessarily have a legacy of faith that's been handed to you. You don't necessarily have this library of knowledge in your mind about the Bible and about God and about the history. Maybe the call for us is that we too can offer an invitation. Maybe it's just seeing somebody who seems to be a little bit further along in the faith and saying, hey, can we grab coffee so we can talk about this? 
Maybe it's just showing up when things are planned for the church and announcements are made. We say, you know what? I'm just going to get around those people. I'm going to get around their stories. I'm going to get around uh, their behaviors and how they act. I'm going to get around and maybe just kind of glean some of the stuff that they know. Cornelius surrounded himself with those who were just a little bit further along in the story than he was. And that is how the transformation took place in his, his life. That's how the, the trip from his head to his heart unfolded. And it was part of the grand story, but for this grand story to happen, it, happened to, it had to happen to someone else as well, right? Peter, Peter had to make that same exact journey, the journey from his head to his heart. Now let's talk a little bit about Peter. Like I said, he grew up Jewish, little boy, he would go to the synagogue. He would hear the stories. He would hear the scriptures of the Jewish people opened before him. He would hear about the Messiah. But what is more is when Peter got older, Jesus himself, the Messiah, invited Peter in to live with him day in and day out, to get a front row seat to the miracles, to the teaching, to the way that Jesus put his, his knowledge and his wisdom into action. But here's what we have to catch. Even though Peter grew up with his legacy of faith and he got this library of knowledge from Jesus, man, it was still hard for him to make that trip from his head to his heart. I mean, I love Peter because I relate to him so much. I mean, he was always kind of getting things wrong. There was a time that Jesus was saying something he had to do and Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, no, Lord, I don't think so. You got that one wrong. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. That would not be very encouraging. There was tons of stuff. Another one, Jesus was all the time talking about love, love your neighbors, love your enemies. The last night before he was arrested, he was with Peter and the other disciples. And he said, a new command I give to you that you love one another. The world will know you by the way that you love. And Peter went out and promptly cut off somebody's ear for threatening Jesus. <laughs> Maybe a story that some of you have heard of is the time that um, Jesus had been arrested and Peter was confronted by someone. Hey, don't you know the guy? And Peter denied knowing Jesus. After all the years with him, he denied him three times. And before he got a chance to make amends, Jesus was killed. His friend, his Messiah. And I wonder if there's some of us in this room who can kind of relate to the story of Peter. We've been in this thing a long time. But sometimes it feels like we're lockstep with God and we are cruising along. And sometimes it feels like we are 1,434 miles away from God. What we need to hear today is every road trip has mountains and valleys in every road trip, sometimes you're on cruise control and sometimes you are stuck in traffic, maybe broken down on the side of the road. But like Peter, we keep going. Peter responding to the call to keep going was so powerful, so fundamental to his transformation. There's one gospel writer. Remember I said there were those four books where those eyewitnesses wrote some stories about Jesus and we call those gospels. One of the gospel writers, a guy named John, he decides to end his story about Jesus with a story about Peter. Jesus, after his death and resurrection, he finds Peter after he had denied Jesus. And he says, Peter, keep going. Your journey's not over. And Peter keeps going. What I would say for those of us who might find ourselves relating to Peter is that we got to keep responding. Maybe it's a neighbor that's in need. That might be an opportunity to respond. Maybe it's a service opportunity at church or a group that's starting. That might be an opportunity to respond. I don't know what the precise response is in your life, but we must remember that no matter if you feel like you're on a mountain or you're in a valley, we keep going. We keep responding. For Cornelius, it was inviting people in, surrounding himself with people who were a little further along than him. For Peter, it was responding, knowing what he needed to do even when he didn't feel like doing it. 
That's that 12-inch trip that's happening in these guys' hearts. Here's what I love about the scriptures. What I love about the scriptures is they are so real with how this really looks. And that's what we see in the next uh, passage that we're going to read together in Acts chapter 10. So turn back with me. Acts chapter 10, uh, starting at verse uh, 23. The next day, Peter started out with him. So these, these men had come for, from Cornelius, from Caesarea down to Joppa. They said, hey, Peter, we think we're here to get you. He said, yes, that's me. They stayed overnight. And then the next day they left to go back to Caesarea to talk to Cornelius. So the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, they arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met them, and he fell at Peter's feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Come on, man, stand up. He said, I'm only a man myself. While talking with them, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you are well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit with a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any obligations. Uh, This is kind of a funny scene that we'll miss if we don't peel it apart just a little bit. Cornelius grew up in a culture where people in authority, you treated them like gods. So when Peter shows up at Cornelius' house, he bows down in reverence. Well, that ran all over Peter, right? Because he had grown up that you treat no man as if they are a god. So we're kind of having a rough start right out of the gate. And then uh, Peter begins his message uh, to try to start to win the hearts and minds of these people. And he starts it off with, hey, y'all know I'm not supposed to be around you dirty people. (laughs) When you're trying to win some hearts and minds, that's not really how you start the message, right? Right? But he's wrestling with this thing that is inside of him. This this 12-inch trip from his head to his heart. And what we have to realize is that sometimes in the journey, even after we've chosen to, to try to be someone who Jesus is transforming, there's going to be rough patches along the way. There are going to be tension points. I have got a really... Uh, like a cheesy pop culture reference for you. And it's not even like a current one, okay? So get ready. This is going to be kind of old, kind of cheesy, but here's the deal, all right? Jesus wants to take the wheel, but we like to keep our foot on the brake, right? My notes say pause for groans. (laughs) Y'all didn't groan like I thought you would, but it's okay. But you know what? There's truth in that. There's these tension points where Jesus wants to take us somewhere and show us something, and we want to pump the brakes, right? Right? Jesus might want to take us toward words that are kinder and maybe a little bit more patient. And we want to pump the brakes and say, oh, man, that's not really me. I just call things like I see them, and sometimes it comes out rough, it comes out a little mean, but I ain't going to change for nobody, right? Jesus might want to steer us toward people who aren't exactly like us. And we want to pump the brakes and say, oh, Jesus, you know, it'd be so much simpler to have this party and not invite them, right? Right? Jesus might want to steer us toward prayer and worship and learning more and maybe even serving in church. And we're like, pump, pump, pump the brakes because who has time for that, right? There will be tension points that we sense along the way. It might not be bowing before people like they're gods or calling people dirty, but we're going to sense it. It's going to happen. And we have to recognize a truth of this story. The tension is something we have to persevere through. And tension is not necessarily a bad thing. You see, when you think you've arrived, when you no longer feel the tension, then you probably have stopped transforming as well. Tension happens but it means you're on the journey. The story ends with something that I think can bring comfort to us all. It's this idea that even our struggle to do the right thing cannot stop God from doing great things. 
Acts chapter 10. We're going to go down to verse 34. I'm just going to read that verse, then I'm going to skip a few. Um, Follow me here. Uh, Acts chapter 10, starting at 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. And then Peter went on to share the gospel about Jesus' teaching, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And then we jump down to verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, which just means the Jewish people, uh, the Jewish Christians who were with, with Peter, who had come from, uh, with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. They heard him speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, surely no one could stand in the way of their, them being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. God didn't even wait for Peter to stop talking before God started doing great things. Cornelius is wrestling with his culture and his ways and Peter wrestling with his culture and his ways. It didn't stop God from doing great things. The grand work was going to unfold. The gospel was going to go from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. The world was going to be changed. And it started with two people allowing a much shorter journey. Things that they had believed and heard about God, the things they thought about God in their head, moved into their hearts for them to be able to respond and experience For Cornelius, it was inviting people in, and for Peter, it was responding. I don't know what it is for you, but what I do know is we all have these Jerusalem to Rome stories going on in our lives, these stories where it seems so big, so insurmountable that God could possibly make an impact in those places. Maybe maybe it's your family. You know God has peace and purpose for it. But man, it just doesn't seem like you're anywhere close to that. Maybe it's your faith. You see people who seem so committed and and so full of life and they're experiencing so much joy, but man, you feel 1,434 miles away from God. And you don't know how that could ever be you. Maybe there's real tension going on between you and another group of people who are nothing like you. We can't miss that that is a major theme of this story. And you don't know how that could ever change. We all have Jerusalem to Rome stories, and here's the deal. It can be really, really overwhelming when we think about that big, big journey that's necessary. It can seem insurmountable to think that things could ever possibly change. But the thing that we have to hear today is it starts with a much shorter journey. A journey where the gospel goes from our heads to our hearts. A journey where you align your heart with the heart of Jesus. So my encouragement to you today is glean this wisdom from Peter and Cornelius. Invite people around who maybe are a little bit further along in the faith than you. And if you've been in this faith for quite a long time, your journey's not over. Keep responding when called. And for all of us, recognize that our struggle to do the right thing will not stop God from doing great things. Let me lift a prayer for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the gift of this story, not only because it represents your gospel going out from Jerusalem to Rome and to the ends of the earth so that we could hear about it, but it also represents a much smaller trip from people who are willing to take the trip with you from their heads to their hearts and let you do your work. Thank you that Jesus can do that, not only in our families and communities and our cities and our world, but he can do it in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.